Hey, Walter Sorrells back with more tips for the knife maker. Today, making a knife for a UFC legend. So I was contacted recently by John Danaher, who's a uh, jiu-jitsu trainer for a number of uh, high-level uh, cage fighters uh, and um, jiu-jitsu practitioners, and a uh, really interesting guy. Anyway, he was interested in having me make a modern spin on a traditional Japanese knife known as an Osaraku Tanto. Now, an Osaraku Tanto has a very long, thin tip. This is going to be a more modern spin on that, something that could be used for uh, carry, self-defense, uh, put it in your bug-out bag, whatever. This is a fairly complex and tricky knife from a variety of perspectives. Really one of the most interesting knives that I've done on YouTube yet. Now, some lessons to be drawn from it, particularly with respect to grinding. And I'll also show you how to make hamones on modern blades. Now, as some of you may know, I'm starting a new semi-production line of blades that I'm calling Tactics Armory. I'll be using this knife as sort of a working prototype for a blade I'll be producing for my Tactics Armory line. It won't be exactly the same as this, but if you like this design, check out my website, waltersorrelsblades.com, for the Tactics version. John wanted a blade that's sort of a modern interpretation of a traditional Japanese defensive knife. As a basic inspiration, I'm patterning this blade after a knife known as an Osaraku Tanto. Now, the Osaraku has a short bevel and a secondary ridge, along with a very long sweeping point. The basic construction of the knife will be of a modern type, full tang, micarta handle, and so forth. Now, there are a number of interesting grinding challenges in making this knife, so I'll use this video to focus on some of the off-the-beaten-path aspects of using a belt grinder. I'll be using 1095 high-carbon steel for this knife. The composition of 1095 is about as close as you can get in a modern steel to the sort of steel that would have been used by Japanese smiths a thousand years ago. I'll be developing a hamon on this knife, a characteristic feature of the traditional Japanese blade that's sometimes incorrectly referred to as a temper line, and to do that I'll need carbon steel. You can't do it with stainless steel. My stock is fairly thick, it's 3 16 of an inch, or 0.187 inches. This will help with the Osaraku geometry, as well as helping to support the very long sweeping tip, which is characteristic of this type of knife. I'll start by drilling 3 16 inch clearance holes for the Corby fasteners that I'll be using to attach the handle to the blade. I'm doing this on my mill so that I can drill the holes for the handle scales at the same time using the mill to drill everything to a few thousandths of an inch. I'm using black canvas micarta for the handle scales. If you aren't familiar with micarta, it's a laminate material made from cloth and phenolic resin. Tough, durable, and with an interesting wood grain pattern that reveals itself when you profile it. Now, of course, there are much less tool intensive ways to drill holes so that the scales may accurately to the tang. See some of my other videos to see alternative approaches that are easy to do in a shop equipped with very simple tools. Since this is a design that I haven't made before, I like to keep the drawing very loose and use the grinder to work out the final shape of the blade. I'll put tape on the bottom of the blade to avoid scratching it up too much as I'm grinding. A little footnote to this process. I often see people doing really elaborate designs on paper or sometimes using CAD systems. And 
often you end up with a knife that's really cool looking but that has major problems in terms of either construction or ergonomics or both. By working out the shape and testing the feel of it as I go on the grinder, I'm able to end up with a knife that actually fits my hand. Now, a quick note about curves in knife design. The eye gravitates towards simple curves. These curves can be described geometrically. Arcs of circles and ovals, sinusoidal curves, parabolas, and so forth. By using the radii of various wheels on your grinder, you can easily build these sorts of attractive curves into your design. But what if you don't have a wheel matching the size of a particular curve that you want to make? In this case, I'm making the finger grooves using a 5 8 inch diameter wheel on my grinder. This is really too small for a finger groove. Now, I've got enough experience on a grinder that I can enlarge the groove to a pleasing shape, but let's say I wanted to really nail a curve with an exact 1 inch diameter. Check this out. I just tape a piece of sandpaper to a 1 inch Delrin plastic rod, insert it in the chuck of my lathe, and boom, I've got a 1 inch grinding wheel. Now, two points here. First, if you do this, be very, very careful about where you put your hands. Smacking your fist into a spinning lathe chuck will send you straight to the hospital. But, a second point. You know, most of my viewers aren't going to have a machine lathe like this, and that's okay. You could use any rotating machine, including a drill press, a bench grinder, router table, whatever, to rig up a similar grinding attachment. Or, you can also buy small grinding attachments with replaceable abrasive sleeves in a wide variety of diameters that fit drills and rotary tools like Dremels. Now that we've got the shape roughed out, I'll trim the scales on the bandsaw. Now this is not necessary. You can just glue them on square and grind off the excess later. Six of one, half dozen of the other. Just be careful not to cut inside the lines if you trim them this way first. You might think you can trim them exactly to shape, but no, forget it. We're working to thousandths of an inch here, tolerances that are just impossible on a bandsaw. So you're ultimately going to have to grind them to shape, no matter what you do. Now comes the skill part, grinding the bevels. Before stampeding to the grinder, I'll mark a center line to grind to. I'm using poor man's layout fluid to make the line a little bolder. You can make a single line as I did here which works as an exact center reference or you can do double lines and work all the way to each of those lines. Either way works. The Osoraku shape is kind of tricky to do. There's a flat edge along the body and then the tip sweeps upward with its own curve. It's two very distinct sections. Now normally that tip is a little thinner than the one that I did on this more traditional version, but you can see the general point. Now your bevels should track the edge perfectly. In essence, you have two grinds, one for the short body of the blade, which extends straight forward, then a second for the tip, which sweeps upward. I mentioned layout fluid earlier. If you weren't sure what I was talking about, here's the real stuff. This is used by machinists to lay out and mark work for machining. I'll show how that works here. Again, using my scribe to mark lines perfectly parallel to the edge. Then I'll just grind the bevels to those lines. Now, sounds easy, but if you're just starting out, you'll find this quite challenging to do. It just takes practice. Even if you're experienced with a grinder, these bevels are kind of subtle and they're no laydown.
Once I finish the bevels, I'm ready for heat treating. In this case, I decided to do something a little special. You know, my background is in Japanese swords, and since the client's an accomplished martial artist, I figure let's stick with that Japanese theme as tightly as we can. I'm going to differentially harden the blade using the same basic technique used in the making of Japanese swords. Now traditional smiths applied a mixture of clay, limestone, ash, and sometimes other ingredients to the blade to act as a heat sink during the quench. This causes the edge to harden while keeping the spine soft, increasing the shock resistance of the blade. To this day, differential hardening solutions are used in a wide variety of industrial products which need both surface hardness, which tends to brittleness, and toughness, which requires softer steel, transmission shafts, things of that nature. Of course, the technique used to get there in industry is totally different. Now, in my case, I'm not using the exact traditional Japanese clay recipe either. This is a refractory cement known as Satanite. I mix it roughly to the consistency of a thick milkshake and then apply it to the steel with a popsicle stick. At the juncture of the hardened and unhardened portion of the blade, a visible line will emerge. This line was an important aspect of the aesthetic design of Japanese swords. In that spirit, I'll execute a complex hamon, making this blade unique and unrepeatable, as easily recognizable to its owner as a face or a fingerprint. Incidentally, hamons have become popular on modern forged blades. If you're interested in learning more about how they're made, I've got a video available on my website, waltersorrelsblades.com. You can click the link to my page if you're interested. Since this is a pretty complex knife, I'm going to go ahead and break this video in two. To see how the heat treat comes out, click here for part two. Hey, uh, let me interrupt for a quick plug here. You know, it takes a ton of work to make these videos. I try to use the best cameras, lights, audio equipment. I do voiceovers. Uh, I take, you know, close-up shots. Um, it's all to help you learn more efficiently. If you want to help me make more and better videos, click the link for Patreon. It's a service I've joined forces with recently that helps creators and patrons, you know, kind of find a way to help each other out. So if you value this channel, show the love, baby.